the well, committee members who are here. We do have a quorum. We had set the quorum at four, and we have a few more than that. Um, thank you very much for coming, and we look forward to these discussions. First meeting was more about procedural issues, and I think we have sorted that out. Today we have an agenda that will look at the main aspects of the bill, a presentation by the Ministry of Health and Wellness team. And so maybe what I should do is ask them to introduce themselves quickly, and then we go into the minutes, and then from Chairman, there on. Chairman, Pro just a procedural matter, sir. Before you do that, mm -hmm. if we could just um, have into the records and the, these documents that we would have received, the letter from the JTA. All right, so let me mention that. I was actually going to go there, too. Thank you. And we would have had the minutes. The? The minutes of the last meeting. Right. So I was actually doing item for my welcome and opening remarks, oh, and then I was okay, going to go sorry. right into it. My apologies. But, um, but nevertheless, I mean, these are good letters for the committee. So I was going to ask the team over here to introduce themselves, and I was going to mention it. So you want to just quickly introduce yourselves and your substantial position. Starting with you, Mr. Edwards, if you don't mind. Not at all. Morning, Chair and members and colleagues, Albert Edwards, Legal Consultant, Ministry of Health and Wellness. Thank you. Cheryl Dennis Wright, Legal Officer, Ministry of Health and Wellness. Michael Tucker, the Executive Director, National Council on Drug Abuse. Good morning, everyone. I'm Colette Curlew, the Director of Client Services at NCDA. I'm not a part of the team, but Shanae Cunningham, Legislative Council of the Houses of Parliament. So I'm just You're what? Legislative Council here at Houses of Parliament, not a part of the grand well, scheme of things. Still would like to know who you are. Yes, no problem. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, we have received, first of all, we, we sent out 25 letters to the list that we agreed on last meeting and we so far have received two responses one from the jamaica teachers association um, and essentially they thanked us for the invitation to make a submission but they are declining the invitation because as they say and i'm quoting we do not possess any expertise in this area um, uh, that's pretty much it, right? Um, so they have declined, Jamaica Teachers Association. The other letter is from the Jamaica Hotel and Tourist Association, referring to our letter, the 24th, 2021, inviting the JHTA to make a submission on the bill entitled the Tobacco Control Act 2020. Please be advised that the association has no objections to the bill. So the JHTA is saying that they support the bill. Uh, that's my interpretation. For the record, we'll put that there. Um, we will continue to follow up on the other entities to see if there are others who, and I suspect there are others of the list here, or generally speaking, was the ad carried? When was it sent out? Okay, so an ad was placed in the print media with a deadline for submission for next Wednesday. May I see the ad? Okay, so I'm viewing here the Sunday Observer of which Sunday? February 28th. And I understand it was public. Oh, and the Gleaner of the same day? The same day. So the ad was placed inviting persons to make submissions with the deadline being next Wednesday. So we would have followed through on that commitment at this level. Um, beyond that, I want to also recognize uh, Ms. Celie Brownie and Mr. Wilkins will be watching the proceedings on PB. 
CJ and Mrs. Aldridge. Okay, so they are part of the, the technical team. So we have also online viewing and I'm sure they can, they can respond. Um, I'm sure in touch with the team here. All right, so can we move now to matters arising from the, or the minutes, sorry, the minutes. So the minutes are before us, page one. Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. And page six. If there are no objections, can we confirm the minutes? So moved by Senator Sapphire Longmore, seconded. Okay. Thank you very much. Matters arising. Any comments on the minutes? Any comments? No? Okay, fine, we're making good progress. I think we're all anxious to hear the presentation. So we're gonna ask now the ministry's team to do a presentation on the bill. I think it's important because what it is allowing us to do is to appreciate as best as possible the clauses in the bill to ask questions as to what may be you know, of concern or for further clarification and understanding by the committee and hopefully by those who are looking on from home or, or other places. So this is very important. And please jot down your questions and let's use the opportunity to fully, fully appreciate why this bill is important and why the clauses are necessary. Okay, Mr. Edwards, are you the one who will lead that charge? Um, Chairman? Yes. Uh, clarification. Um, I think it's, it's, it's relevant to me before we even get started with the, because of the context. The memorandum of objects and reasons of the bill, um, last line of the first paragraph, uh, framework to deal with tobacco control and takes into account current market practices related to the advertising and promotion of tobacco products and relevant products and smoking generally. My seeking clarification is around smoking generally. Is, is, are we, is this all smoked products? Um, are we, when I, when I hear these presentations, am I to think in the context of cannabis, other smoked products, or is it only tobacco? Because that smoking generally kind of gives a, a broader um, concept than I, than I thought. Uh, Mr. Edwards, will that feature in your presentation? It, it, it will to some extent, but, but, but if I may, um, Chair, okay. mm -hmm. in respond to the, the direct concern raised by the Senator. The context within which the reference to smoking is stated is in the context of tobacco control. So just for clarity, that, that is the context in which it is stated. So although it seems broad to speak of smoking generally, it is in the context of tobacco control. So this bill is not seeking to move beyond tobacco and related products, relevant I, products. I realize that, so maybe we say smoking tobacco generally. Uh, um, a modification could be made for clarity, but I think, I think the context earlier in that paragraph would have spoken to tobacco control policies and um, that we're seeking to implement the framework convention on tobacco control to deal with tobacco control. Yes. And then as a supplement, it takes into account market practices and, and smoking generally. But the smoking generally is in relation to tobacco products and relevant okay, products. So, so that could be a modification. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, so thank you. Mr. Edwards, you want to begin the presentation? Are you okay? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So, members and all present, the purpose of this overview is to place the roadmap, so to speak, to implementation of the provisions of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control in context. So you will note that the convention is the first of its kind. It's a public health treaty. Jamaica has been a party, full party, since 2005. And it is worthy to note that the FCTC, as it is called, Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, is an evidence-based treaty. So if one looks at the treaty, you'll see that the treaty was developed due to scientific evidence in relation to the effects of tobacco smoking with a particular concern on the effects on youth and the vulnerable in developing countries. So I just want to, we just want to put the bill in that context because it's been a road leading to where we are today. Tobacco control, what it is. The bill defines in clause two, tobacco control, a range of supply, demand, and harm reduction strategies to improve the health of the population by eliminating or reducing the consumption of tobacco products, etc. This puts the structure of the approach to tobacco control in context. Basically, one seeks to control demand on one hand, so there are measures relating to controlling demand of persons for tobacco. And in relation to those, we will see price policies, provisions relating to management of premises, etc. And then there's a supply side, which deals with trade aspects and also control of access by children, by young persons. So supply, demand, and then harm reduction, which is a particularly new element that we'll see in the tobacco control bill, where provision is made for dealing with cessation strategies and strategies to reduce dependence on tobacco. So that puts tobacco control in a nutshell. The main themes, and what we have done is looked at the main themes of the convention because the bill is intended to give effect to the convention. So the main themes are price and tax control. This is not going at this point included in the bill before us today, but there are provisions in other pieces of legislation, as I think many of us would know, that deal with price strategies in relation to tobacco products. Prevention policy. Now, non-price measures, so the tax and price measures are the price measures to reduce demand. We have in the bill significant provisions in relation to non-price measures. So we'll see that these are those that protect, seek to protect persons from exposure to tobacco smoke. Secondhand smoking has been determined to be a significant health concern, public health concern. There's provision for regulation of the contents of tobacco products, regulation of tobacco product disclosures by manufacturers and suppliers, provisions for packaging and labeling of tobacco products. Now, what we need to indicate is that the, the bill is in a significant, to a significant degree, restating provisions that appear in the existing, the current law, the public health tobacco regulations, to some extent, especially in relation to matters like exposure to tobacco smoke, packaging and labeling. The bill is just making some minor, relatively minor modifications in these regards. The new areas I'm coming up to are the provisions for education, communication, training, and public awareness control, restriction, 
prohibition on advertising, promotion, and sponsorship that is new. Demand reduction measures, provision for to dealing with tobacco dependence and the cessation, that those are new also. Also new are provisions relating to control of illicit trade. Now, there are provisions in existing law that deal with trade matters, particularly on the all revenue legislation, such as the Customs Act. But um, this bill is dealing with illicit trade to some degree, even in respect of labeling requirements that require labels to say that products are made in Jamaica. That is a form of control to ensure that if products, um, that, that you're able to identify the source of products and the movement of products and determine when they have been moved in an illegal manner. Mm -hmm. Intended for sale, yes, the, the, the labeling would speak of intended for sale in, in Jamaica. And then we have provisions for sales to and by minors. Provision is made in the Child Care and Protection Act, Section 40 for this, but this is the first time we'll be seeing in dedicated tobacco control legislation, this type of control of sales to and by minors. Provision for economically viable alternative activities, that is a matter that will be dealt with in broader policy initiatives and not in the comprehensive legislation, although that is a significant objective of the FCTC. So moving along, I want to highlight another article, Article 5. One of the general obligations of states, parties to the FCTC is the obligation to ensure that there is some immunization or separation of those who are involved in tobacco policy making from influence by vested interests of the tobacco industry. So this is a significant new provision which we'll see section eight, clause eight of the bill deals with this um, important cross-cutting issue of ensuring that public health policies, tobacco control policies, are immunized, so to speak, from commercial and other vested interests of the tobacco industry. So going back to main themes, smoke-free environment, bans on tobacco marketing, tobacco cessation, communication and information, and what we want to point out is that even prior to the public health tobacco control regulations of 2013, as amended in 2014, several other pieces of legislation give tangential effect to Jamaica's obligations. So although Jamaica became a party um, in, in full party in 2005, there are prior pieces of legislation which were actually giving effect to some of the matters addressed by the FCTC. So we find that the GCT, Excise Duty Act, make provisions for price and tax measures which would have some effect on reducing demand for tobacco. There's also provision in the Broadcasting and Radio Rediffusion Act in relation to the advertising of tobacco products in the electronic media, and I think we would, we would realize that. Um, and then we also have provision in the Customs Act, which would uh, deal with aspects of trade, illicit trade, controlling illicit trade in tobacco products. So although th these predated the FCTC and Jamaica's joining onto it, they are provisions that have, in a piecemeal manner, been able to address some of the issues that the FCTC seeks to have states um, adopt. So as I said before, the Child Care and Protection Act deals with the issue of sales to and, and by minors, but it's, um, it, it's not broad enough. So the FC, as significant as it is and as useful as that provision is, Section 40 of the Act, 
the comprehensive legislation proposed before us in the bill is intended to cover a broader range of protection in terms of um, you know, sending children to, to buy tobacco products or children being involved in the sale or supply of tobacco products and relevant products. So where are we now? Where, where were we pre-2013? So we want to put it in context. So pre-2013 is before the regulations. We are rather cloudy. Um, our temperature, I'm sure the chairman will agree, at that point was kind of low, kind of cold in terms of tobacco control steps. So let's see how we are progressing as we go along. So the tobacco control um, regulations, public health tobacco control regulations, have made provision primarily, yes, for the general public, but with emphasis on matters relating to the workplace, matters relating to children also. These Sorry, Mr. Edwards, could, could I just ask you to go back one slide before the picture slide, if you don't mind? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that is looking at the scope of protection. Of course, when we speak about the workers, we're speaking about controls of tobacco in the workplace. Tobacco. Go back further. The, is it this one, Senator Goley? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay. So with those regulations, Jamaica became partially compliant with the FCTC. Three of the seven core non-price demand reduction provisions were addressed. And what are those? Protection from exposure to smoke, tobacco smoke, regulation of tobacco product disclosures, and packaging and labeling. So those articles of the FCTC were largely implemented between 2013 and 2014 under the existing public health tobacco control regulations. And why we mention this is because the bill is restating um, a lot of those provisions. So the bill is not, is not um, modifying, we're, we're, we're building, it's a building process. So as we say here, the bill will seek to pick up from where the regulations left off and we seek now to deal with those issues of policy protection from industry influence, further demand side reduction, dealing with regulation of product contents, public awareness, advertising bans, reducing tobacco dependence, and further supply side reduction in terms of dealing with illicit trade and sales to children. Uh, I'm just going to go through um, a little um, background in terms of where Jamaica is. Uh, this was done a few years ago, but it's still relevant. The, the WHO determined that Jamaica's um, position in relation to the enactment of tobacco control legislation is strong because of political commitment, strong civil society support, and a committed national coordinating team, a number of whose um, representatives are here, and the fact that tobacco control has been integrated in sectoral plans in relation to several um, aspects of national life. And the existence of a national health fund is also a supporting factor for the implementation from a public health point of view of tobacco control legislation. Well, identified as a weakness then was the fact that there's no comprehensive legislation, and this is what the bill is seeking to address. And also matters of intersectoral coordination, resource allocation, those are being, um, th th those are being dealt with so that we hope that in the near future we will not be assessed um, in, in this regard, but we'd have moved beyond these steps. The opportunities seen for tobacco control is, is public support. Um, generally, um, the dangers of tobacco smoking are accepted by a large cross-section of the people. 
and there is global and regional movements targeting tobacco control and stakeholders willing to strengthen contribution to assist with implementation. So those are the opportunities. The recommendation um, at that time was for the comprehensive legislation to be enacted. Uh, that's why we are here. So the tobacco control bill tabled in December consists of 39 clauses, 11 parts, and six schedules. Let me just um, give a little summary of the structure of the bill. So we have the administrative provisions, sections 46 or clauses 46, which deal with matters of ministerial power, the education and information campaign. Those are highlighted in the administration because a lot of emphasis is placed on getting public support in relation to this topic, tobacco control. Part three deals with the matter of controlling and protecting tobacco control policies from undue industry influence. So we see there are all of four provisions dealing with that aspect. So we see how significant the implementation of Article 5.3 has been treated. Next, we have um, provision requiring manufacturers or suppliers of tobacco products or relevant products and uh, to give notification to the minister before engaging in such activities. We're going to see some key definitions shortly because Members may be asking what are relevant products. Relevant products actually means nicotine products or nicotine devices as opposed to direct tobacco products. And then part five of the bill, which is another significant provision that has been incorporated largely from the work done in relation to the regulations is Part five. Part five deals with the prohibition of smoking in several places. And I think most, all members and the wider public would be familiar with the changes that the public health regulations brought about in terms of signage and labeling and restriction of um, smoking activities in certain public places especially. So that's because of the tobacco control um, the public health tobacco control regulations, which the bill now seeks to incorporate as clause 12. And then there's a display of no smoking signs. Again, that was a provision that the bill picks up from the, the regulations. Now we have part six, which deals with tobacco products or relevant sales. This is where we speak of protection of children in section 15. And then clause 14 is speaking of the requirements that have to be conformed with in relation to the supply, manufacture, or importation of tobacco products. A person who is seeking to supply, manufacture, or import tobacco products or relevant products must do so in accordance with the requirements of the Act on pain of a penalty, criminal penalty, for contravention. And then we move to, and, and there, are, there are some 10 provisions there. There, there. There's more than one provision dealing with aspects of protection of children. And then significantly, we have provisions relating to graphic health warnings, which are not new but which are again being restated from the, the regulations of 2013, provision for graphic health warnings, prohibition on public and self-service displays. Um, this is important because the idea is that tobacco products should not be the kind of product that can just be accessed off a shelf. Somebody should not be just able to grab um, a, a, a tobacco product um, off, off a shelf, easy access, being easily accessible. And then we have provisions for the information required to be stated on packages. And I'm sure many, if not all of the members gathered would have seen the kinds of labeling or the, 
the, the matters that have been promoted in terms of warning, the con warning of the consequences of tobacco smoking, some of them rather graphic. Um, these come from the legislative initiatives starting with the regulations and continued in these um, provisions of the bill. So then we move to part seven, which is a new provision, um, clause 24 of the bill, which seeks to control, not just control, ban advertising and promotion of tobacco products. Then we have part eight, which deals with information requirements. There is a need for the authorities to be kept informed of the activities of industry. And therefore, we have provisions consistent with the requirements of the FCTC um, convention for information to be supplied by those who are involved in manufacture or supply. Now we have enforcement provisions. Again, this is new, where authorized officers are given um, significant powers, but significant for the purpose, in relation to inspection and uh, basically seeking to enforce the, the, the compliance with these provisions. Who do we mean by authorized officers? If we could turn to clause two, page two of the bill actually. Authorized officer means a constable, meaning any police officer. The term constable means any member of the Jamaica Constabulary Force. Customs officer, inspector under the Standards Act, medical officer health, and public health inspector, member of the JDF assigned to serve in the Naval Force and any other person that may be designated by the minister from time to time or designated in a relevant enactment. Those are the persons who will be given enforcement functions under the legislation. So we have a significant part there consisting of four clauses for enforcement. Now, part 10 may be of particular interest to the, to the wider public because it provides for a fixed penalty regime, meaning that there will be a ticketing system for many, if most, of the provisions will have the opportunity to discharge liability for offenders or alleged offenders to discharge their liability for conviction. And, and of course, they will um, save themselves a day in court by being able to pay a fixed penalty, which is a reduced amount from what would be the potential maximum liability if they went to court and the conviction was successful. So you have a fixed penalty regime, quite detailed, and then we look at the miscellaneous provisions. I should also mention that the bill provides that there are graduated penalties based on whether you are appearing for the first, second, or further. Um, in relation to offenses under the act. So a first offense, a second or a third will attract different levels of penalties, both for individuals and for corporate bodies. So there is a, a gradation, the corporate offender pays more than the individual. All right. Just for clarity, Mr. Sure. Just sure. for clarity, through you, Chair. Um, could you define these offenders? You made reference to the corporate, mm -hmm. but I assume, based on what I'm seeing in the bill, mm -hmm. that there may be offenders like the smokers. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just for clarity, mm -hmm. and also those mm -hmm. who may sell mm -hmm. within proximity yes. of the defined institutions, mm -hmm. those who, who, mm -hmm. who you would align as as mm -hmm. the offenders, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there'll be graduated penalties, different penalties assigned. Yes. Okay. And in fact, and in fact, we, I, I'm glad you you, you, you raised that, that 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 matter because the penalties.
for, like, say, the small seller, the small trader, that person is treated as an individual. As an individual. Not as a, not as a corporate entity. Like the man who walked with a cigarette. Right. Or... That's right. So, so it's significantly lower. Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm. And uh, the, the question now of the ticketing system. Yes. Because at, for, a motor, for a motorist, that ticketing system will be applied by your driver's license. Mm -hmm. In this case, I'm trying to make the connection as to how it would apply for a regular individual who may not possess any form of identification. Mm -hmm. All right, if we, if we uh, what, and what I need to mention is that this ticketing system would be similar to what we actually have for other aspects of life, such as littering and, and so on. So it's not, it's not new to have this type of ticketing beyond the area of motor vehicle infractions. Uh, but the, the, the power is given to an authorized officer. You remember I had indicated a rather long range of persons who fall within the description of authorized officer. The, the power is given to an authorized officer if that person, I'm looking at clause 31 of the bill, page 35. The power is given if that person thinks that somebody has committed an offense. And of course, um, you know, that can be an individual or a corporate entity, that they have committed an offense then they give them the notice, just in the same format as would happen in relation to a traffic ticket. They're, give, they're given this ticket, and if they do the payment within the prescribed time, they, are, they save themselves the liability for conviction and having to go through a court process. See, when I look at it, sorry, Chair, or when I look at it, Mr. Edwards, in terms mm -hmm. of those defined as authorized officers, mm -hmm. I can see where the constable and the member of the Jamaica Defense Force, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, maybe we have to look at the powers now mm -hmm. given to these authorized officers to carry out the function. Mm -hmm. Because the authority, I. I, I can readily understand the authority of a constable, but the authority of a medical doc, a medical officer mm -hmm. at the Ministry of Health to carry out and effect that function mm -hmm. now in terms of a penalty. Mm -hmm. um, maybe later on you can enlighten us as to what approach or mm -hmm. how that will yeah, yeah. actually work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, since, because... since, since as they are all designated as authorized officers, yes, yes. but don't have the same level of power. Yes. All right. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to allow you, member, um, since I was so lenient with my colleague, closer to me. Thank you very but much. After, Thank after you very your much, comment, <laughs> That's fine. After your comment, I want him to complete the process because of the time restrictions we have today so that we can have some well, general conversation. I will eat and wait until you sure? Okay, finished. fine. Are, Based on, um, I may forget. <laughs> no, that's why. That's why I said jot down. <laughs> Chairman, is right. it that on the next occasion, then we'll take the question? Yes, is yes. That, is it okay? uh, no, no. We, we're going to try. Depending on how long it takes to complete, uh, we're going to open for discussion. But I just want to make sure we, won't we have can. much time for that. So I'm... Yeah, we'll, we'll. No, no. We expect the two sessions next okay. session to okay. also be committed Great. to this. Thanks. Go ahead, um, Mr. Sir Edwards. So. Um, so I was just giving an overview of the bill, and then we have several schedules dealing with matters such as labeling, penalties, etc. So that just gives a, a, a summary of what the, what the bill is like. And it seeks to comprehensively implement the FCTC, the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, adding implementation of seven more major provisions to so the three that are currently currently implemented by the regulations. So moving on, um, the exposure to smoke, um, significant, that's Article 8 of the FCTC implemented by Part 5 of the, the bill. So in essence, in essence, 
prohibition is um, provided in relation to certain locations, such as enclosed public spaces, enclosed workplaces, public conveyances, as well as prohibition of smoking or holding a lit or electronic product. Now, we need to point out that this bill is not, is going beyond looking at just the traditional smoke, smoked tobacco products, but to the new electronic um, tobacco products, you know, the, the, the ends, the, 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 the vaping, the whatever. So these products, whether or not they have the traditional tobacco um, smoke, they, once they fall within the categories of tobacco products or relevant products, the prohibition on using them or even holding, holding them. So that's why I speak of smoking or holding in these locations applies. Uh, that's just a definition of, of enclosed. Uh, we sp speak to the fact that a space that is covered by a roof or enclosed by one or more walls is treated as enclosed, whether the structure is temporary or permanent. So it doesn't have to be a, 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 an enclosure as secure as the chambers we are in now. Um, it can be a, a place that may seem um, rather frail, but for the purposes of the law, an enclosure is any space once it's covered by a roof, has one or more walls, regardless of the type of material of the roof, is treated as an enclosed space. Um, public place is defined essentially as, as anywhere, structure, facility, place of assembly or other place used collectively, available to be used collectively by the public. So whether or not the public are actually using it, once it's available for use by the public. So if you go into a park and you're the only person there, it's a public place. It doesn't have to have other persons in it at the time, including a government office and a space or a building, regardless of the, 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 the ownership. So it's not a matter that we're speaking of places owned by public authorities. We're speaking of locations that are available and accessible and intended to be used collectively by the public. Public have right of access. So a supermarket owned by a private entity is a public place for this purpose. All right, so we're just emphasizing again that the law, the bill, applies to both lit, lighting up, and electronic smoking. Electronic nicotine delivery systems ends, such as e-cigarettes. And we have provision in relation to the restriction on smoking, again, these are restating our current law in the regulations, and we are building and, and, and carrying on the, the, the relay, so to speak, towards a comprehensive um, um, ban on comprehensive management of tobacco control. So public conveyances, use in public conveyances is also control. What do we mean by public conveyance? any form or mode of transportation which carries, carries passengers for hire or reward, whether in Jamaica or internationally. So we're speaking of including our um, sea craft and aircraft. Once there is a connection with Jamaica, then they fall within the description, the definition of public conveyance. And it's public conveyance, so we're not talking about your private motor vehicles. And it is, um, yeah, so moving along, workplace, this is significant because of the controls in relation to management of smoking in the workplace. So the workplace for the purposes of the bill is any area or place used by persons during their employment, whether they work on a contract of service or contract for services and it can even include a vehicle. If your employee, or if you are employed in a 
in, in, a, in an industry or in an activity that requires you to be in a vehicle. The vehicle is your workplace. So the restrictions in relation to being smoke-free, the ensuring of smoke-free environment, that applies in relation to a vehicle, whether it be a, whatever it is, whether it be a, a bus, a, a truck, a plane, it will be applicable to you. All right, um, th those are definitions that we can um, look at, um, at at a later point. Uh, we, we just emphasize these because these are some key new terms that appear in the comprehensive bill which would not have appeared in the regulations. Because of the, the, the dynamism of industry players, so we speak about ENDS, the electronic non-nicotine delivery systems. So we have those devices that are electronically operated that deliver an aerosol, but they don't contain nicotine. The um, legislation is seeking to control the use of those items. We have the definitions of nicotine device, nicotine product, and relevant product. Uh, nicotine product is a substance or mixture that contains nicotine other than a tobacco product. The, de the, the device now is what you have that enables you to use the product. So you have the device and the product works with the device. Uh, tobacco products, a key term which we're going to see throughout the legislation, means a product other than a nicotine product. So we have the separation between tobacco products and relevant products. So a product other than a nicotine product made entirely or partly from tobacco leaf and which is manufactured for smoking, chewing, inhaling, snuffing, or consuming in, in, in by other means and includes a tobacco device. And the tobacco device is what you would use with your tobacco product. Okay. So the prohibitions, uh, going back to the bill itself now, so if we look at clause 12 and the second schedule, this identifies the, the places, the spaces, where we seek to ensure that the public have smoke-free access. So health facilities, including pharmacies, sport, athletic, and recreational facilities for the use of the public, educational institutions at every level, bus stops, areas designated for use by children. These are all control areas in relation to ensuring a smoke-free environment. Further, the, the bill, again in Clause 12, continues, meaning we pick up from the regulations, continues the prohibition on smoking or holding a lit product within five meters, five meters being 16, virtually 16 and a half feet, of the entrances, exits, windows, and ventilation intakes of those places. So the idea is that even if you're not at that location, even if you're not at or in that location. Once you are within five meters of the entrance, exit, windows, or ventilation intakes for, for, for air conditioning, for example, you are in breach. And this seeks to recognize the significance, the significant health um, consequences of second-hand smoke. Required signage, I, I won't go into detail on that. I think um, we, a lot of us, uh, we are familiar with the restrictions that require posting of no smoking signs. Um, this is just dealing with some of the details in relation to no smoking signs, where they should be placed, and the, the, the description of the required signage. Going further, what we want to point out is that there's nothing in the law in the proposed law that prevents an owner or operator of premises that is controlled by the, that, well, that will be controlled by the proposed legislation 
from going beyond the requirements of the law. So if the law prohibits smoking in certain locations, in enclosures, and you as an entity, you may be a restaurant, a hotel, bar, whatever, you may wish to control smoking in the total environs of your premises, even if the law does not so require. Nothing in the law prevents you from going beyond the minimum requirements, because the bill is giving the minimum. There are some entities that will say, we don't, once you reach five feet from our gate, we don't want any smoking at all. Now, there are certain conditions that have been um, allowed. The, the law allows for outdoor smoking areas to be established by certain entities, such as bars, restaurants, clubs, and tourist establishments. So the law allows for some um, concessions, outdoor smoking areas. What do we mean by an outdoor smoking area? And again, this is restating the regulations that currently exist. All such areas shall be open-sided, so no walls. If they have a roof, they only have supporting columns. They must be at least 10 meters from any structure or area where smoking is prohibited. So it's, it has to be like a, an, an, an annex away from the main building. Once that building is a controlled building. And it must be located in an area where access by persons other than those smoking is not necessary. So in other words, it mustn't be somewhere that's a pass-through for your staff who have to go from one part of your enterprise to another. It must be a place that is separate and dedicated for the purpose of smokers. And the final requirement is that it must be physically separated and structurally unconnected to areas where smoking is prohibited. So it really is an, an annex we're talking about to, to, as a concession um, to the, th those who desire to smoke. Furthermore, in those areas, even in those areas that you have dedicated for those who wish to smoke, you mustn't have any promotion of tobacco products. So no distribution, promotion, branding, or sale in the very place where you are allowing people to smoke or form of entertainment. The idea is that it, it is a concession, but it must not appear to be a, a lounge that you're creating by having this smoking area. Uh, now, there are certain significant obligations put on the owners or operators of our proprietors of, of premises. One, they must ensure that no child is permitted to enter or stay in any area that's a control area. That use, we're talking about the outdoor smoking area, so no children, no children allowed to enter. Users of the area must ensure, that, must be told that the staff do not serve. As I said, the outdoor smoking area is not to be a lounge in disguise. And furthermore, um, smoking, once there is cleaning or other related activity or servicing activity that has to be done in that area, then smoking is prohibited. Because of course it will have implications for those who work and their exposure. All right, so the responsibility is on the owner or operator to make sure smoking is not allowed. Um, I'm moving on from that. Um, disclosures, another significant uh, addition um, in relation to the legislation, although this is restating, again, provisions from the regulations is tobacco product disclosures. The manufacturers, are required to provide information in relation to ingredients. So, so there's still 
control in relation to the industry. The manufacturers are required to keep the authorities, keep the ministry informed of the product types, the quantities, the characteristics of the leaves used, leaves used, tobacco leaves, and any changes to the product when a, when a change is made. Furthermore, if the minister so requests, the manufacturers or suppliers are also required to supply information in relation to design features, including the tests that may be conducted on products by, the, by industry, and the lab reports on tests relating to design features of the products that they are um, supplying or manufacturing. Okay, that's, that's just dealing with um, routine information. Packaging and labeling, I'm not going to go into much detail on that because I think there's a lot of general knowledge and the detail is available to members. Packaging and labeling requirements, I, I would just say again, part six of the bill, clause 20 seeks to address this, which is implementing article 11 of the convention. And the, the, this, is, this goes into a lot of detail as to the types of um, warnings that need to appear on the products, health warnings, the size of the warnings, the, the fact that on the principal display panel you must indicate your trade name and the common name of the item. So in other words, it must be clear what you're buying, it must be clear what is being um, made available to the public, but you, there must also be warnings as to its likely effect. So these are, uh, these are actually quite detailed in relation to, uh, I, I mentioned uh, in particular this provision which requires a statement that sale is only allowed in Jamaica. This is important because this is a measure to help control the illicit trade of um, tobacco products. So basically, each state where tobacco is um, developed, is manufactured, tobacco products are manufactured or supplied, will be expected to have a statement on the packaging indicating that sale is to be in its own territory. Uh, yes, yeah, so those are more details about the, the health warnings that need to be stated um, and, the, and the size. We, we moved up to 80% of the surface area now is required. Um, before it was 60, 65, 60, it was 60, and it's moving to 80% of the surface area must indicate the health warning. So, so you will realize that a significant part of the product packaging will make it very clear um, of the, the likely consequences of, of smoking. Okay, so I'm going to, okay. Another thing that's important for, for us um, to note is the prohibited markings. 80% of the surface. Okay, well that's the, which, which part of, that, that's an error then. That, that's probably stating what is in the regulations. That's the current law. It's actually moving to 80% under the bill. So I think there may, there may have been uh, one or two leftover references. Yeah, we're moving from 60 to 80%. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I just wanted to indicate is that what is prohibited from being put on your tobacco product packages? One, a best before date, an expiry date, or a sell by or similar date. The truth is, the, the concept is that tobacco is inherently dangerous. So it's not the type of product that you will be saying, oh, well, it's best you use it before April 1st. <laughs> or it's, exactly, it's best you don't use it. <laughs> but, um, so so that's, that's not to be stated on the product. Um, also, 
any false, misleading, deceptive, or erroneous information or impression that may be given about the product, its health effects, hazards, or emissions um, also are prohibited. Misleading descriptors such as light, ultralight, ultra mild, low tar, etc., those are also prohibited. Any graphic or package design that is likely to be so in, or intended to be associated with anything that is misleading, that is also prohibited. And a number to differentiate brands within a brand family is also prohibited. So you can't have um, number X or number Y of the, of the product. Um, and a number associated with a smoking machine yield, that's also prohibited. And, and the, I, I'm going to ask my, my colleague, the, the, the health warnings, there is a system of rotation of these warnings so that it's not continuously the same warnings um, without any, any change. I'm going to ask my, my colleague, um, Mrs. Dennis Wright, to explain the concept of the rotation of the graphic health warnings. Okay, so the rationale behind the rotation is that once you have a set number of images over time, then people become accustomed to that and then the effect is weakened. And therefore, there is a period in which only one set is allowed. Apart from that period where one set is allowed, there is a transitional period of four months where both sets are allowed to be on the market while you are phasing out. Right? So as I said before, that is just to allow the, the effect um, of, the, of the rotations, or not, not the effect of the rotations, but that's to allow the effect of the images to be as strong as possible. And then there are provisions that are made for these images to be updated from time to time. So there is set A and there is set B. And you would notice that set A is predominantly the colors black, white, and red, while set B is predominantly red, yellow, black, and white. And the periods are clear. The rotation takes place in or around um, May 31, that is World No Tobacco Day. And there are, as I indicated, there are specific dates in which this should be um, highlighted or in which this should really take place. Um, each set is to be used exclusively for eight months. And as I said before, the transition period is for four months. In the legislation, it will designate when the sets are to be used. So if we are to look at 2019, for instance, from June 2019 to January of 2020, the set that was allowed was predominantly set A. Then the transitional period started from February 2020 to May 31 um, of the same 2020. And then from June to December of 2020, we would move to set B. Now currently, we are in set A. Um, however, we're, we're now what, at March? So it should really be predominantly set A, but we are allowing for the transition to take place within these months up to May 31. Thank you, thank you, Cheryl. So, so the, the, the idea is that the, the impact of the health warnings is maintained by the, the, the rotation, so it, becomes, so it remains fresh in the, in the eyes of the, the public. Okay, so, and there we see um, a, a significant warning there from um, late well-known journalist John Maxwell. I wish I had quit before I sickened my lungs. All right. Um, yeah, as we said, I don't have to, to say any more than what that slide says about tobacco and the nature of it as a product. 
So where are we? We're, we, we moved between 2013 to 2020. 2013 being when the public health tobacco control regulations were um, brought into force. And 10 to 2020 is when the tobacco control bill was tabled, December 2020. So we note we're a little lighter. It was kind of all smoggy before, a little lighter. Chairman, where do you think our temperature gauge is now? We were very low before. We were actually quite cold in the blue. We're getting closer to 1130. That's what I'm sure of. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so that puts us a little warm then, I suppose. <laughs> All right. So um, enforcement, I, I, I won't go into many more details. I looked at the ticketing system, graduated penalties, uh, the pause of authorized officers we can go into in detail at another point. Penalties, maybe I sorry. sorry um, uh, Mr. Edwards, I appreciate the presentation and there's a lot to chew on mm -hmm. up to this point. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, given the time, we probably can spend another 15 minutes or so, mm -hmm. we should engage, we should suspend the presentation here mm -hmm. and then start this new phase next sitting and maybe allow the, the, the members to probably start some some of the burning issues that they may want clarification on. Mm -hmm. Members, you, you, you think we could probably do that and sort of break the monotony of the presentation? Okay. Interesting monotony, sure, though, sure, don't, sure. don't get me I, wrong. Yeah. Um, so, so let me ask... Um, uh, Chairman, I don't have Gould. a question. I'm just noting that we only have eight minutes, and I don't know that we can get into any useful discussion in eight minutes. So I, I would respectfully um, ask if we could just hear as much of it as possible. And then when we come back, we'll be prepared for the questions, yes. All right, okay, continue then, Mr. Edwards. Th thank you, Chair. And of course, members have this um, presentation in soft copy. Okay, so penalties, I uh, just want to, want to emphasize the, the range of penalties. So for the individual, uh, I recall um, Senator Gale was raising a matter of penalties for, for a small offender. So we talk about the range for first offense, and these are maximum fines. So for the first offense, 200, second, 500, up to a million for a third offense. And when we talk about offense, we talk about meaning conviction, conviction. Yes, go ahead. Just turn on your mic for me, please. Just a quick question in respect to the first offender. You're talking about the ordinary citizen on the road or you're talking about a business? Um, because it's not clear. In this case, Member Douglas, this is the um, individual. This is the individual, yes. But these are, these are maximum penalties. And these are not the ticketed amount. So in other words, whenever you see a maximum of, say, 200,000, the, the ticket range may be 25. Or, or less, you know. So these are where you go to court. These are the penalties if you are convicted in court. And these are the maximum penalties if you are convicted. Mm -hmm. Maximum. Mm -hmm. so, so to compare the maximum for individuals with the maximum for corporate bodies now, um, the corporate bodies, first offense, range from 500 to 750 for second offense 750 to a million and for third up 1.5 to 2 million and um, I, I just go back to this slide because this addresses the matter that um, senator gale had raised the, if you look at the footnote the fines for individuals apply to the small shop owner the itinerant vendor and peddlers. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. So, as I had indicated before, in terms of enforcement, the new approach is a fixed penalty regime, and we have graduated penalties throughout the bill. Although the regulations provided for graduated penalties, meaning first, second, third conviction, it's much more detailed. You'll see a whole schedule of a range of, of, of offenses in relation to the the, the, the bill. Now, 
This, uh, this part of the bill is significant because we're dealing with the engagement with, between public and industry. Now, there has to be engagement between public officials and industry because if we're talking about regulating or controlling aspects of an industry, there has to be engagement. The, the issue is, and if, if members could turn to, to Clause 8, because the, the, the issue of importance in, in this regard is that even though there has to be some engagement between public officials who may be involved in aspects of tobacco control and industry members, the question is, is the involvement more than what is strictly necessary? So clause eight on page 12 speaks to the fact that a person who acts on behalf of or for the benefit of a public body which has responsibility for tobacco control shall not, whether in the person's individual capacity or otherwise, interact in any manner whatsoever with a person in the tobacco industry in furtherance of a business activity. So this is interaction for commercial purposes. This is not just a social interaction at a cocktail party, except where it is strictly necessary to do so in order to ensure the effective regulation of the industry. So if the interactions must be above board, must relate to the regulatory activities so, of Mr. the So, Mr. Edwards, this, this mm -hmm. clause, sorry to, but let me exercise some chairman's privilege, if you don't mind, given that we only have a few minutes. Cl clarify it a little more for us. The, the, is it saying then that neither sh whether government or individual should have no interest in, the, in, in partaking or sharing in the benefits from a tobacco-related investment. Is that what it is saying? In other words, you can't have shares in a tobacco company, for example. It, it, it would be, although we are aware of some, some concerns because of existing arrangements, but definitely going forward, it will be expected that one would not be engaging in, in, in future in terms of new interactions with industry. If, you're, if those interactions are for commercial purposes and don't relate to the regulatory controls of, of um, tobacco, regulatory controls in relation to tobacco use. So if it's strictly commercial engagement, then this would really apply. This section would really apply. But we are aware of, of um, some prior... Um, Mr. Edwards, just um, tacking on to the chairman's intervention, the, does that contemplate then a, a, a citizen who may be part um, who may invest in mutual funds for argument's sake, and those funds um, are collectively invested in a number of different companies, one of which may include um, a tobacco-related um, commercial enterprise. Um, how do you track that? Because um, it, most people don't even know what their mutual fund is invested in, to be honest. How do, how do you track that for public service employees? That's one. And two, um, from a policy point of view, are we really, uh, is, uh, help me to, to get the link between what I am loosely calling untoward influence on the public officer if they own 100 shares in a tobacco company? Chair? To, to you, Chair. Remember, yeah. we're speaking of a, of a relatively small category of public officers. We're, we're speaking of persons who are involved in or have responsibility for tobacco control. So it's not, we're not speaking here in Clause 8 of every public officer. We're speaking of persons who, for example, may be the officer responsible for, for regulating the, the management of tobacco control, and 
we're speaking of limiting that person's activities, that person's commercial or business activities away from involvement with the industry that they are directly involved in regulating. So it's not so, so we define officer. those persons in the bill. We have specific provisions defining well, that category. You know, we have there is no? actually okay. transitional provisions, and we're, and, and we're glad for for this topic to be raised, Chair, because there's a transitional provision in clause 36, which speaks of every person whose operations are subject to this act. You're granted a, a period to bring the, your operations into compliance. No, no, the, it may be a broader policy issue as to how we deal with the public officer who may have investments that involve um, tobacco industry um, activities. But there is provision for some transitional arrangements to the extent that we say that it may cover those. There is provision for at least a six month um, transition to, to get one's house in order. But this is really only intended to cover the person whose work is directly related to tobacco control activities. Go ahead, Mr. Edwards. Well, we can go on for another five minutes. So I also want to point out clause nine, moving on from eight. So eight is dealing with the individual who is directly related to tobacco control activities, the, the public official. But nine now is dealing with the broader category, any public officer, any person employed with a public body shall not A, this is section nine, if we can find it on page 13 of the bill, a person employed with a, let me see if I can, can bring it up on this. Um, no, it's, it's not, it's not, um, it's, it's on the, the bill copy that members would have. A person employed with a public body shall not A, enter into, support, or endorse a partnership of any kind with the tobacco industry, including taking part in initiatives or participating in activities of the industry which advance or appear to advance the interests of the tobacco industry. B, enter into any agreement, MOU or voluntary arrangement with the tobacco industry or support or endorse any code of conduct established by the tobacco industry. C, accept from the tobacco industry any direct or indirect financial or resource contribution to become involved in or endorse in any manner any initiative, campaign, or program directly or indirectly related to tobacco control, including but not limited to youth access and education programs and public education campaigns. What these provisions point out is the, what is described as an irre irreconcilable conflict even if the industry players appear to be endorsing activities which on the face of it seem to be for the public welfare, there is a conflict of the public officer being involved in any of these activities. Even if they appear to be education programs or or even if they appear to be control activities relating to tobacco control itself. Finally, Clause 9 prohibits public officers from accepting from the tobacco industry any offers of assistance towards the development or implementation of tobacco control policy. So even if it appears that the industry players are supporting the controls on tobacco use, there is a conflict for public officers to be involved in those activities with members of the industry being regulated. 
Thank you. So that, okay, so you're completed that irreconcilable conflict clause or set of... We, we could probably pick it up um, next year, because we're, we're, right. we're moving close to the end. So we, no, we probably right. just... So we'll continue, we'll close here yes, then? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes, great. Sir. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Edwards and team, for the presentation so far. I trust that members would have jotted down some notes and questions, concerns for the conversation that will take place after. So what, what I'm proposing is that we will pick up with your presentation to complete. How much more time do you think you'll need to finish next time? Maybe 40 minutes, Joe. Not, 40? Not, not more than an hour. 40 minutes. Okay, and then we'll have an hour 20. These sessions will go on for about two hours to have a conversation, at least start that conversation. So next sitting, we expect that we will still be very much on this, on this issue. Um, all right, uh, thanks a lot. So can we move to item seven, um, eight for any other business? Any other business before we set the time and place for the next meeting? Chair, as you talk about time and place for the next meeting, I know some members may have quietly displayed an interest or a request whether or not these meetings can be held virtually um, for the time being. Um, I don't know if that's a consideration in any way, shape, or form. There are some other joint select committee meetings that have been held virtually and have been successful so thus far. So I thought I would raise that. Yeah. Okay. Um, our members, what's the opinion of members? I know Member Golin had, had stated her position. Yes. And, and I certainly share the same desire for the consideration for virtual, if possible. Any other? Okay, so sounds like we have a, a, a majority position, at least with the members present. So can we then make provisions for that to happen at our next meeting? Okay, so I'm being advised that we would have to move a motion in the lower house to get that approval. All right, so I'll, I'll, work, I'll work on that. We work together on that, and then we, we, we get that through. All right, thank you. Any other matter arising? Any other business? No? All right, so let's set the date for the next meeting, and I think we're proposing April 8th at 10, 10 a.m. 8th of April at 10 a.m. Hmm? It's a Thursday, by the way. Hmm? You're not available on that date. Okay, anybody else not available? Be because we're doing work. We have a, we have a, there's a clash on the Wednesday. That's a challenge. And it's the same staff, even if we're going virtual. Sorry, if it Okay, all right. All right, so let's, let's, um, let's tentatively propose the 8th, uh, Thursday the 8th at 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I think this request might be a bit of a sore point for some, but is there a reason why we start at 10 as opposed to 9 or 8.30? Um, is, is there an objection? T at 10 o'clock, usually we close off for lunch. It doesn't give you a lot of time to get through the specifics of this bill, and I think there are some really particular points for discussion and explanation by the team. If we could have a bigger chunk of time to be able to do that. I'll also commit, Chairman, I, I have some questions, quite a bit of questions, and I also commit to, to sending those to the team and through you um, prior, in sufficient time prior to the next sitting, so I can, I don't waste as much time here. 
Right. So, I mean, I could adjust to nine. I can't go before that because of other commitments that I have. But if members are okay with nine, we could do nine to 12, if that's all right. Is that okay? I'm getting the nod. So I, okay, so we'll do the eighth at 9 a.m. Right, 9 a.m., right. Okay, so if we're agreed on that, then that's good. And uh, then it's just then to close today's sitting. Thank you very much to all members and the team from the ministry who came and gave support primarily to Mr. Edwards who presented. We look forward to continuation of the, the sitting and the discussion around the bill. Thank you very much. Meeting adjourned. Watch the 2021 budget debates on PBCJ and find out how much money the government plans to spend on security, roads, water, housing and other services. The action kicks off with Minister of Finance and the Public Service